This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, so um, Anja Sveboroska is going to uh, give her talk on processing music on the fly with Python. Give her a big hand, please. Um, hi, yeah, my name is uh, Anna Sveboroska. Tricky one. <laughs> and um, as Alessandro said, I'm going to tell you how we can process music on the fly with Python. But before we dig into details, like details, let me introduce myself, what I do, and why I even talk about things like that. So I work in a Berlin-based company called Ableton. Uh, it's a company in the music industry, and it's especially popular among electronic music makers. We develop main three products. First is a digital audio workstation, which means it's a piece of software where you can record, edit, and produce your music. But apart from that, it was designed to be an instrument that you can take to the stage and perform live, hence the name. Last year, we introduced Link, which is a technology that allows people to jam together on different electronic instruments, thanks to synchronizing them in time over the wireless network. And last but not least, we developed this piece of hardware, and that's what I do at the company. Uh, this uh, controller lets you uh, control live um, without looking at the computer screen, so it helps you capture your musical ideas quicker. Okay, but let's back, get back to our main topic, which is processing music. What does it mean to process audio? Well, basically, these are any modifications on the incoming sound you can think of, but in our presentation we're going to focus on a very particular example, which is transcribing music. What does transcribing music mean? It's basically presenting notes in a musical notation. And uh, what we are going to do is to first play a sound, then read this audio stream, detect what notes were played, and uh, convert them to a music notation, to some notation, and ask other instrument to play it back for us. So we have to think of three things, basically. First of all, how to read our data, how to store it so that we can process it later, how to detect our notes, um, how to figure out if the note was, first of all, played at all, and then what pitch it had. So was it like C or E, and in what octave? And then how to represent it so that other instruments are able to play it not caring what was the initial instrument that played it. Okay, so uh, let's try to briefly find answers to these questions without getting into implementation details yet. So first of all, let's think about what is an audio stream? How to read this data? So audio stream is a continuous signal, right? And when we want to uh, perform some operations on it, basically, first of all, we have to digitize it, right? so that we have a finite set of numbers instead of infinite set of um, uh, continuous signal values. So uh, to come up with a set of finite numbers, we have to sample it, which means we uh, decide was it, what is our sampling rate, which is how many samples of sound we're going to take per second, and uh, obtain these values. Okay, so now we end up with a discrete function with finite set of numbers, but their values are still an infinite set of numbers because they can have arbitrary numbers of infinite resolution, right? So to fix that, we need to quantize our signal. It means we just decide what is our set of values that we are going to map the real <laughs> continuous signal values uh, into digital values. Let's say it can be integers. So it means that we get um, our amplitude that can be any real number, and in our um, well, in the simple scenario, we just find the closest integer value to this number. Um, okay, so now as we know how to read it theoretically, we need to decide how to store our our data, what data type to choose, so that we can later quickly manipulate our data, uh, perform some operations in an efficient way and how to even store it so that we don't use up all our memory. Okay, next question was how to detect notes. So first of all, uh, we need to uh, find out that the note was actually played. 
Uh, in here, you, you see the waveform of uh, waveform plot of two nodes played over two seconds. Uh, so it's easy to tell, okay, this is where each node happened. And once we find this, we want to know what pitch it had. So we are rather uh, concerned with frequency of the sound. Here, we can't really tell in time domain. That's why we convert it to frequency domain. Uh, and you can see that here are two significant pitch, meaning two nodes had different sounds, had different frequencies. Um, okay, so then if we figure out how to find these values, we have to think of how to represent this node that we found. So in um, acoustic music, what we're familiar with is this. Uh, this music notation everyone uh, probably has already seen and we have to think about what's the equivalent of it in digital world what is the standard so that other electronic instruments like synthesizer or synthesizers or other software can actually uh, play it back okay so um, this is a dia diagram of the application i prepared for you to have um, um, some scenario that we can follow and uh, have a closer look at the implementation later. So, um, before we see it live, how it works, I hope the demo is gonna be is gonna work. Uh, let's quickly brief how um, what the concept is. So we're gonna play a note, read um, as we want to process these sounds in real time. We need to read chunks of data at a time and then process this chunk of data. Processor consists of two parts as mentioned, detecting onsets and pitch. Then write the note down once we found it and send it to some other instrument. Okay, so let's see how it works. Um, first of all, we're gonna see a pure Python version of the application, which is I'm gonna play this wonderful thing, some people's elementary school drama. And um, I'm gonna ask my application to uh, play a piano when I play a playback piano note when I play um, this recorder. Okay, let's see if it works. Ah, sorry. Uh, we have no audio, audio um, output, right? So, uh, Can we make it louder, maybe? Uh, yes. <laughs> you can't hear it. Okay. Can you hear it? Okay, you can hear the pen. Fine. Okay, this is... <laughs> okay. Okay, whatever. That worked. So now, no, wait, wait. <laughs> Let's, uh, now with some very um, slight uh, modification, we're going to ask it to oh, Jesus. Um, okay, we're going to ask our application to um, where is my console? Okay, to use a piece of software to interpret this note. Um, what we are going to use okay, is um, before mentioned Ableton Live. Well, as with live demos, everything can go wrong, right? And it usually does. Okay, so I hope we are back on track. So let's see, um, let's now focus on some implementation details of this thing. Uh, so what I used for reading the data was uh, Pi Audio, which is a set of Python bindings for Port Audio, which is a, which is a cross cross-platform library for playing and recording audio. It also supports real-time input and output. This is what we needed. This is how you instantiate the stream. And what's interesting in here is that um, it works. It can work in either blocking or not blocking mode. Here we're using a non-blocking mode using some callbacks. And let's see what is the call, callback signature in here. 
So uh, what's important here is that it, a callback needs to always return a frame count sized array of data and a flag letting our application know if it has to, if, if it wants to receive some more data. Um, okay, so now we know how to read it. Now let's think of how to store it. In a, in a previous slide, you saw that we are reading, it's the second line, we're reading our data, which we get as strings. Uh, we read it into a NumPy array, and we uh, convert it to integers. Of course, it's easier to manipulate integers and strings, right? And then you might ask, why are we using NumPy arrays and not Python lists? Well, it seems obvious because NumPy arrays um, give us uh, a lot of uh, useful optimized routines to make operation on big matrices, which is our data. And uh, it provides us with some um, common yet complicated operations that we widely use here, like fast Fourier transform and so on. But what's also very important is to know why actually NumPy arrays are more performant than Python lists. Um, they're both implemented in C, so what is the difference? Well, the difference is that Python lists can store elements of various types, right? So, whereas NumPy array takes uh, elements of the same type. So it means that Python lists, while it allocates memory, it actually creates an array of pointers uh, to Python objects, because it needs to store data information as well. Whereas NumPy array can simply uh, store um, a pointer to a contiguous, um, uh, contiguous memory because NumPy array is kind of a Python object wrapped around a C array. Uh, as a result, NumPy, NumPy um, arrays can benefit from vectorized C implementations, whereas uh, Python lists sadly need to perform a check type and perform code dispatch for, for each element. Okay, um, let's continue. So we read our data, we started in NumPy array, now we want to process it. So first, uh, we want to detect the onset, we want to know that the node happened. So what we do is we calculate the power spectrum of the signal, and it uh, basically represents the strength of variations in the signal. So here we see two big disturbances in the signal, meaning two nodes were played. Uh, then on top of it, we apply, it's the green line, spectral flux. Spectral flux enhances these changes even more because uh, it's a, it shows us how quickly the power spectrum changes over time because it's obtained by comparing uh, the power spectrum of uh, one se segment of data um, against the previous one. Okay. So uh, now we can see that there are some peaks, but not all of them are relevant for us. We, we want to end up with just two uh, visible peaks, not so many of them. So what we do is we apply a thresholding function, which is the red line in here. And a thresholding function is um, obtained by getting some, um, like defining what chunks of data we are going to average and then multiply it by a constant. So we have two parameters that we can tweak. One is threshold window size, which is the number of um, segments that we are averaging, while the other one uh, is the multiplier. So, uh, and we can tweak it to obtain uh, results that are satisfactory for us. Here we can see that we could tweak it a bit more because still we are not left with two significant uh, peaks. And in the um, and implementations, actually, it looks a bit different. Uh, okay, so once we found our peaks, which are our nodes, we need to de uh, determine what frequency they have. So to do this, we create something called substrum, and it can be thought of a spectrum, of a spectrum of the signal. Well, formally, it's defined as an inverted Fourier transform of the logarithm of the spectrum. But let's not be scared about this. What we, are, uh, what we want to focus on is that uh, the inversion itself. So, substrum is the name derived from the one word spectrum, but with just some let, uh, letters inverted, uh, just to um, put accent on inversion process. So, why would we be inverting spectrum? So basically, when we calculate the Fourier transform, uh, what, we, what we do, we find 
periodic patterns in our signal, meaning we find sinusoids that appear in our signal. Whereas here, we want to do something similar, but with harmonics. So it's good to know that every node consists of a fundamental frequency uh, and its multiplications. And it also appears in our spectrum with some frequency. And uh, it's also known that for high frequencies, the harmonics are more coarse, so their frequency is less. That's why um, in, in Sebstrom, uh, the coefferency value that we see here, which is like frequency also, but inverted, um, the high frequencies will be represented at the beginning of it. Okay, that's, I guess, <laughs> enough um, uh, signal analysis for now. And uh, in this substrum, we want to find the tallest peak because it's our fundamental frequency. But uh, we can also, before we do this, we narrow the frequency frequencies to the ones that are interesting to us. I narrowed it to frequencies that I can play on this thing, which is from 500 to 1200 hertz. Okay, so um, we apply the narrowing and then we find the maximum value in our uh, substrum and then we have to convert the frequency domain to frequency domain. And it's obtained by just dividing sample rate per uh, the value from the substrum. Uh, frequency um, variable. Okay, so here, this is uh, our real um, our example that we've been analyzing the whole time. Uh, as we saw there, our peak in frequency domain is around 28, but we have to remember that we narrowed our uh, substrum. So we have to find um, the index of the start which is for 1200 hertz and it's uh, number 36 and add it to, to our index. And that's how we obtain our fundamental frequency, which in this example is 689 hertz, which corresponds to a um, node F, I think. Okay, so as we, as we could see here, um, we ap applied also some correction to the, our onset detection algorithm because we eliminate nodes uh, from the frequency range that we are not interested in. Okay. So we have our notes, we have its pitch. Now we want to uh, write it down, right? Code it somehow. So um, uh, as we know that we can just write notes and stuff for acoustic music, what do we use for electronic music? We use standard called MIDI. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And it's a protocol that defines how electronic uh, devices can communicate with one another. Uh, it sends MIDI messages that contain, uh, that um, uh, consist of three bytes. The third byte contains uh, the message type. We use, we, we use note on and note off to indicate if the note should start being played and stop being played. Um, uh, the number of a channel, we see that the channel is encoded on uh, four bits. It means we can uh, have up to 16 channels pitch and velocity. Velocity is perceived as loudness of a sound. Okay, so as we can see here, we have seven bits for pitch, which means it can take values from zero to 127. But then, how does it correspond to frequencies that we have? How do we map these values to frequencies? Well, that's how. And this is basically what happens when you apply it to frequencies. Uh, so this is a chart that shows us what MIDI values different notes have. In our example, you can see there uh, our note F has MIDI value 77. Okay, so we found our notes, we wrote them down and coded. Now we can fit it to some other application or a synthesizer. That's what we did. The first pure Python implementation was using PyFluidSynth and it's also a Python binding for something called FluidSynth, which is basically a real-time software synthesizer for generating music. And it can convert a MIDI note to an audio signal using something called sound font. Sound fonts defined instruments. I chose this lousy piano, but there are many other sounds that you can find. There are libraries available online. Okay. And in the second scenario, we could, we used our bigger application thanks to setting up a virtual MIDI port and uh, that we wrote information to and then our digital audio workstation could read from it. And uh, we set it up using 
a library called Simple Core MIDI, written by my colleague. And it's actually really that easy to set it up. Two lines. <laughs> but one line to set it up and the other sends uh, notes. And, and as it uses Core MIDI, which is a macOS framework that provides ABI for communicating with MIDI devices. It unfortunately only works for macOS, but there are plenty of other solutions available for other platforms. Uh, probably not as easy, but it's possible. Okay, so to wrap it up, what conclusions can we draw from this kind of hack? Well, so first of all, even though Python would not be an obvious choice for audio processing applications, we can see that um, it's good enough <laughs> to code something like this, to prototype our ideas quickly, to try out different solutions, to identify bottlenecks for our application. And it's all possible thanks to our amazing numerical libraries, especially uh, thanks to super simple input-output operations, uh, well, super simple comparing to C or C++, uh, which are usually choices for audio applications, and a set of other really good wrappers around very useful libraries with great API. So the code that got executed today is available on GitHub, and you can see that it's not a lot of code at all. So, uh, yeah. That's it, I can only encourage you to play around with Python and come up with uh, musical hacks as well. Thank you. Yeah, so the thing is that this, this hack is focused on mono uh, sound, which is, that's why it's, it, it says real time mono audio to MIDI, because that's what I don't do. Uh, in such a scenario, um, pitch detection is much trickier because of overlapping frequencies, as you, as you noticed. So, and also that's why it's so tricky, and uh, pitch detection algorithms for polyphonic sounds are not super effective, just like the best ones are up to 70% or something. Yeah, so that's the tricky part. Uh, it is possible, it's not always very accurate though. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sure, but um, I th you have to, uh, but what, um, like for example, a violin, like you detect what instrument is being played or? No, no, Yeah, sure, it's like, it would be similar. I, I was just thinking of. Like, can, can you do it or not? Yeah, we can, uh, if, it, if it's played uh, note by note, it's going to work, sure. And human voice? Human voice, I can like, well, that's, it's not when you just, um, deal with um, our scenario, it's not a problem, it just doesn't matter what instrument is being played, like for example I can, ah, we don't have our, and I can yell to it like, ha, and it's going to be detected, it's, it's not a problem, but um, it's a separate thing of detecting what words are said or to detect if it was a human or a violin, then uh, different spectral features would have to be analyzed. But this is just a pitch, so everything gives a pitch. That's why I was sometimes clapping, sometimes yelling, sometimes playing a flute. It's, yeah, everything that has pitch is going to be detected. There are instruments that don't have pitch, like percussion instruments, but, <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Okay, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>